Germany is there. This is an article that was done for Paul Post, who is a, uh, a Saratoga and a reporter, who happens to now as a friend of mine too. He also wrote a book, and I'm in the book. He wrote a book about all different veterans from all the different wars. Uh, I had a time, I had a rough time with the POW because I'm Jewish and uh, be captured by the Nazis is not a good thing. No. Although they did realize that they, we had prisoners too, so they didn't want to cause any problems. But uh, they were nasty. They tried to cripple me. My leg was separated back for apart, my tibia and fibula. Oh my gosh. And uh, they had me walk on it. But there was a French doctor that would, when they found out I was Jewish, they took me out and sent me to Bucharest, where the other Americans were. Did you ever hear of a target called Pulaski? I'm not, I'm not familiar. Did you ever hear of World War II? Yes. <laughs> well, Pulaski was the most important target in Europe during World War II. You heard of the Battle of the Bulge? Yes. Well, we were losing the Battle of the Bulge. And then the Germans ran out of gas, and that's when we took over. We would have lost the Battle of the Bulge if it wasn't for the Floresti. 3,781 men got shot down there. We only went up like 100, 200, 300 men at a time. 1,185 lived. Now there's only less than 200 left. There is an organization that we made when we came back from to the States. Uh, yeah, the Battle of the Bulge. Germans were winning it, but then their tanks ran out of gas, and that's what we wanted. I was already back in the States. I was in a hospital in Butler, Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh. I opened the seventh wall on drive in Pittsburgh. I was in a convertible open car. <laughs> I was only a kid, I was just 21 years old. And uh, I had no place to live when I came home. My father remarried four days after I came back on a hospital ship. Oh, by the way, I came back on a hospital ship with a guy who got the Congressional Medal of Honor, and that's the highest honor you can get. In. Combat. He was uh, known as Papa Newman because he was 35 years old. And we were all like 20, 21, 19, 22, you know. And uh, he was a nice guy. So, um, well, what kind of questions do you have? Um, well, what was your rank? Well, um, well, what branch of military were you in? I was in the Army Air Corps. It then became the Air Force after World War II. Okay. And um, Mr. Segan told me that um, you had a very interesting... I'm Mr. Segan. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Kackner. I'm sorry. <laughs> My mistake. Um, Mr. Kackner told me that you had a very interesting story um, about your plane that was shot down. Yeah, Would you mind plane, telling me about that? My plane... My regular plane was in terrible combat prior to when I got shot down, June 28, 1944. It was badly beaten up. As a matter of fact, in my apartment someplace, I have a piece of what they call flak. You know what flak is? That's the thing that explodes and pieces fall all over. Came by and just cut myself here. If it had hit me, it would have killed me. Uh, but then they had to take my plane and work on it. So they put me in a plane. I'm going to use a dirty word, if you don't mind. That's fine. My captain was a guy, but his name was Captain Boney. But he was called Captain Boney, P-R-I-C-K. Mm -hmm. And he he was court-martial later on. Oh, wow. Yeah. When I came out of prison camp, I weighed 99 pounds. 
my mother had died, and I was told the wrong way that she died from the telegram that I was missing in action. The young man that told me thought I knew, but I didn't. I weighed 99 pounds. I had a hell of a job. I came back. I didn't know my plane was that bad, but we couldn't keep up with the rest of the planes. The whole thing in World War II was the ability to fly in groups. And you had the power of all the, well, 10, 10 50 caliber machine guns, which are machine guns and bullets are that big. Uh, by the way, you know, I spoke at your school. Oh, when? Oh, about five, six years ago. Oh. Seven years ago. What's the name of your teacher that got? Matt Roselle. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. There were three of us there. And one of them just got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He was a black guy. Oh, okay. In Saratoga. Mm -hmm. The blacks weren't treated right in World War II. They were treated as like uh, servants. Mm -hmm. There was a group, though, that did fly, and they were great, and when they flew with us, they didn't have any planes shot down when they flew around, they were tough. Uh, you have any questions? Um, I do. Um, when were you taken um, prisoner um, when you were? In June, the June 28, 1944. And what happened while you were, um, while you were in the camp? I was taken to a civilian hospital. I was there for a very short time in a very small town. They couldn't get me to where the rest of the prisoners of war were. And they finally sent me to a Russian prison camp. But when we got to the Russian prison camp, they found out that I was an officer and they wouldn't put me in with the Russians because they were enlisted men. Romania was run by a friend of Adolf Hitler, Antonescu, who was a dictator. They were a bunch of fools. And, uh, they even, uh, when they saw, the Russians started to come in and they knew that they were going to be captured, they became on our side. They overthrew their uh, dictator and became partners with the Americans. Uh, they, most of them were second and third sons of nobility that didn't get the count or the duke, you know. And they, by the way, the, the Romanian people who were doctors or lawyers or officers in the army did not speak Romanian. They spoke French. And if you're say today, be in contact with necessary. So I was able to talk to them. Uh, they didn't know that I was Jewish. But they, when they brought me to the Russian prison camp, they wouldn't put me in with the Russians because they found out I was an officer. And no, no, we don't put officers in with enlisted men, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew that they were anti-Semitic because I heard them talking to Jew bastards and things like that. And, and, and most of them never even met a Jew. Mm -hmm. It's just that, uh, well, six million Jews were killed in, Europe during World War II. I don't know if you know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a tough time. They finally found out I was Jewish because I finally told them. Because when they brought in a, there was a nun that brought in a picture of Jesus Christ and he kept saying to me, Papa Roma, Papa Roma, and I didn't answer him. Finally I answered and I told him I'm Jewish. And the next day they sent me to Bucharest, where the Americans were. And I was happy, but it was not good. We had one bedpan, and there were bed patients that used to be about 30-some-odd. 
We had one pair of crutches. And I was very lucky when uh, I'm going to get to that. Uh, I was happy to be with the Americans because I'm an American. I was brought and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and I was a. The way I found Glen Falls, by the way, was I was a patient up in Mount McGregor when it was the Veterans Hospital. I turned the car over five times, and the car landed on my war leg, which is a graph from one leg to the other leg. And they did an excellent job. No screws, no plate, no, you know, perfect fit. And I think the captain that did it became a major. I, uh, I wasn't doing good in the first year. I went down to 99 pounds and uh, had dysentery very bad. And uh, I never had a the bedpan that was clean. We didn't have any nurses or anything like that. We had a nun that she tried to put in as much time as she could to take care of us. We used to wash our own uh, bandages, and I used to fold them up, and, you know, put them through where there was a bar on the bed and keep it tight. Mm -hmm. And uh, the food was terrible. And uh, I was very happy when Romania capitulated, went over to the Allies, but then. For three days and three nights, Germany terrorbombed us. And uh, we, I was in a, outside where the hospital that I was in, the Americans were POWs still downstairs on the grounds. And uh, I was with, in an air raid shelter, and there were about nine of us. And all of a sudden, I was the only one left there. And I had the crutches, because I had one when the bombing started with the Germans. And I tried to get out of the, what they call it, uh, the ground, in the ground. The bunker? What? A, a bunker or a, a foxhole? It, it was a, uh, not a foxhole, it was a uh, air raid shelter. Okay. There was a thing over the top of it. Oh, okay. And I did get out, and I started to fall, because the ground was all full of bricks and things like that from the bombing. And two guys grabbed me. One was my radio operator. Okay. He's dead now. By the way, there were seven men got killed when we got shut down. Six of them, one gray, one's buried. He's buried. He was blown out of the plane and he's buried in Belgium, 35 pounds. And he, if you look at him, you see him, he was a big, pretty big guy. Mm -hmm. He weighed 200 pounds. And they're buried in Nebraska, the rest of them. Mm -hmm. I was taken to a big building that was being built for an oil company, Franco American <laughs> was the name of the oil company. And it was a very big building, it was about a 20 story building. We had eight aircraft on the roof. And there were, there were about 10, 12,000 people that lived in that building, but they didn't uh, have what we had. We had, we became very important. Uh, we had a colonel who was shot down too, and he took charge. and. We had people in charge, and we got the food and things like that. And we set up a, we had guns too, and we set up a the. It was 16 floor stories, because right? we had the eighth floor in the middle, and uh, we had guards there with guns. And uh, once the bombing stopped, we were not too bad, but the bombing was terrible, and uh, it bothered me too because. I was a bombardier in World War II. I got the bombs. And uh, you don't know what you do when you got bombs. You're at 20, 22,000 feet up there, which is like four miles. And 
and uh, on the ground, you know it. And I was watching them. The third day that we were being bombed by the Germans, they brought in a truck with bread. And the people came, the building had a set in the middle of it. You're familiar with the Pentagon building? Mm -hmm. You know, the, in the inside and the center? Mm -hmm. By the way, I was a laborer on the Pentagon building. Well, I wanted to get into, after December the 7th, and I wanted to get into the service. I needed my parents' signatures, and they would give it to me at that time. So I went down to Washington, and I got a job as a laborer on the Pentagon building. I was going to that too. I hit me on the head from the third floor. <laughs> Knocked me off my feet. So you yelled, look out on the third floor where the guys were taking off the stuff we were pulling up. And instead of looking out, I looked up. I avoided death maybe four or five times. So I think I have some cat or some family. You're falling asleep? I, yeah, it was a long morning for me this morning. You were out late last night. No, no, I actually had a flat tire this morning, so. Oh, you had a flat oh, tire? Oh, yeah. You go to school together? Yep. Um, so where were you uh, when you found out that Pearl Harbor had been attacked? That's a good question. I was brought up in one of the worst neighborhoods in New York City, a neighborhood called Brownsville. You most likely never heard of it, but there was a group of men called Murder Incorporated, and they did the killings for the Mafia. I think they ended up by killing about 1,500 people in the United States all over. Governor Dewey, at that time, was the district attorney. He wasn't the governor, and he went after them. There were guys like Harry Abadal, uh, Lepke, Garaz Shapiro, And uh, one of them, Abe Ellis, Kid Twist, went over to the Dewey and became a, a Hussite. And he was held in a... In a there was no way that he could have jumped that far. Uh, I was a Boy Scout, and I became a Boy Scout leader. In that neighborhood, there are a lot of very poor people. Uh, quite a few of my friends didn't have steam heat. They had cold, cold water flats, they called them. And uh, they had it in the kitchen would be a stove, you know, that they could heat up. And, uh, I had an aunt, my mother's sister, lived in Cold War flat for until she was 78 years old. And then she was put into a one bedroom apartment by the city in Rockaway. And she came up here to visit me when she was about 94, 95. My cousin took her up, my mother and daughter. I happened to have lived, I'm, I still own the house. Are you familiar with Crandall Park? Mm -hmm. You know where Crandall Pond is? Yes. You know the house by the pond? Yes. It's my house. The, 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 the big, big one. Oh my goodness, really? Yeah. Oh, I, I love that. I've driven by so many times. That's an 18-room house. Seven bathrooms. Two-story indoor garden. Mm -hmm. That's will come later on. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I was talking about it with my background and how I found out about where I was. Uh, and I was in New Jersey up near the, uh, the Palisades area. I mean, it was New Jersey. Not far from where the Washington Bridge goes, of course. And you can walk into the woods there. And a, uh, uh, what do you call these guys that are 
in the woods uh, in charge? Oh, um, you know, it's like the, the I'm, I'm, Anton? Getting, I'm getting old. The Anton, maybe? No, 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 no. I give you a Billy came and told us that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. And my kids who were 11, 12, 13 years old started to yell, whoopee, hooray, we're at war, you know, because they played war. Mm -hmm. And they had no concept of what war was like. And I sat them down and I had a long talk with them and I couldn't help them. And uh, we then left to go back home again. And we had to cross the George Washington Bridge and they had armed guards with fixed bayonets on the George Washington Bridge. Every 30, 40 feet there was an armed guard just in case anybody tried to, you know, sink the bridge uh, across the Hudson River which is up here too, the Hudson River, but it gets bigger down there. And then they realized what was going on, and they were quiet on the subway all the way home. The way I found Glens Falls was I was a patient up in Mount McGregor when I turned over a car five times, and the car landed on my war leg. And uh, I was up here three and a half months, and I fell in love with the area. I am also an alcoholic. I have 50 years, 10 months, and 22 days in AA. As a matter of fact, Saturday morning I went to an AA meeting in South Glens Falls. And at this point I don't go too much for myself, I go to help others. And of course there were people there to help me when I came. I was in VA hospitals being treated for post-traumatic war syndrome. Uh, I lost my wife. I showed you the picture of her. Mm -hmm. and I loved her very much, but I got her back after I sold it up. And I uh, became a good father. Uh, and you going to college? Mm -hmm. Where are you going to go? Um, I'm probably going to go to the University of New Haven. In Connecticut? Well, I, two of my children got their degrees from Skidmore, and my daughter got her master's degree from uh, Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, which is a very good art school. She works for 35 years in a uh, nursing home in charge of a 400 bed nursing home, it's a big one. And, uh, my son, I had one son as a doctor. So once I became sober, I became a good husband and a good father. And then I also did very well. You don't end up with a house like I have right now and, and traveled to it. I've been everywhere in the world. I've been to China three times, India, Pakistan, Nepal, Indochina, Hong Kong five times. Oh my gosh. So I've done a lot of traveling with my wife. My wife didn't uh, drive a car. She was always with me. She was like that. And uh, very happy. And once I got her back, I had a wonderful wife. And so it was very important for me. Anyway, we're in Bucharest. The war is over, but the Germans are bombing us. I got a friend here. Come on. Hi. Everything all right? No. Ice huh? broke over the house. The what? Ice broke at the conservatory over the house. Oh, okay. Can you turn the water off? I've been doing that for the last four hours. You got it off? Yeah. Okay. I have being interviewed by two students from Hudson Falls. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you're fine. He's, he's also a very good friend. Hi. Vietnam. I'm from um, that. Gary. You know, I had a feeling that was going to happen. You know what I did? And for eight years, so she was very good at that. And she helped me with my life. Okay, where was I in Brunei? Talking about the bombing, yeah, I think. Bombing while you were a prisoner of war? The three-day bombing. 
the bombing I did or the bombing that I had? That you experienced. What? That when you were um, a prisoner of war, the bombing that you were experiencing. Oh, well, we had trouble, but we understood it because the Americans would bomb us during the day and the English would bomb us at night. Luckily, none of our guys got killed, but we did get bombed. Uh, matter of fact, the Romanians, where we were in Bucharest, they thought that we, the Americans and English, knew what we were there and they were bombing wherever they wanted. We were in the hospital in the middle of a, there was a long building there, and the wards would go out, and there'd be a ward here, space, another ward here, space. Well, when you drop bombs, you put the amount of feet you want to have in between the bombs where they hit. If you're hitting a very large target, you might have 50, 75 feet. If you're hitting a smaller target, you'll have about 10, 15, 20 feet. And you set your uh, equipment that, that drops it, so, you know, so it bumps here, bumps here, bumps here, bumps here. And uh, that way you make the targets really damaged more than just dropping bombs. You don't want to just blow up one building when you might have to blow up maybe 10 buildings or 5 buildings. And, uh, for that reason, the Romanians thought we knew what we were, that we were bombing the Romanians and not us. Because we were here, and they bombed here, and they bombed here. <laughs> so they really blamed us, and they were angry at us. Uh, I had a cast, I had lice in the cast. I used to have a, a wire hanger that I opened up with, I had some alcohol on, but trying to get in to kill it, you know, couldn't do it. it. I did a little bit of it, but not much. Uh, it wasn't good, the food was terrible. I had dysentery very bad. We had one bed pan, and sometimes it was unbelievable. Maybe three, four guys had had, had but a lot of us had uh, dysentery, and uh, it was no fun. <laughs> and uh, I was very happy when I was freed. It's tough when the Germans bombed us; they killed more people than the three days that they been nice that they bombed us than we did for a year and a half. A year, year and a half. We came back to Italy and uh, there was a kid from my block there. And I says, what are you doing here? He says, well, I've been writing to your mother and father. I said, oh yeah, how's my mother and father? And he thought I knew. He says, your mother's dead, don't you know it? She died from the telegram, you were missing in action. But when you weigh 99 pounds and you love your mother very much, and you hear that, you're not in good shape. And when everything was going bad, and then all of a sudden you're good, you're freed, you're back in Italy in the hands of the Americans. And I became very, very upset. Uh, they had to finally eventually give me some medication and stuff, and then I went to the men's room, the latrine to wash up, and there was a guy in the latrine, a big guy. I want a girl just like the girl that married my old man. Singing it. Because everybody was happy, he just come out of prison camp. And I walked over to him and I said, shut up or I'll kill you. And he got, didn't know what it was all about. So he went out and he found out. But what he was singing was about my mother. And he didn't realize that my mother had died. And he, he gave me his beer ration after that, <laughs> which wasn't good for me because I was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. But at those days, I enjoyed it. And I wasn't that bad an alcoholic in those days. I became worse, 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 and worse. Uh,
I found AA in Brooklyn. And uh, I would say it's the most, not my, my family and things like that, but other than that, it's the most important thing in my life. I became, uh, I had 17 stores. I did very, very well. I was president of the Menswear Retailers of America in the United States and Canada. Thousands of stores. I uh, was invited down to Wichita State University to set up a course in menswear retailing. And there were five of us, and the other four had MBAs. Two of them had it from Stanford, which is about the best place you can get an MBA. And they put me in charge. And I never had any college except for some nights occasionally because I was always in lock wards and VA hospitals. I was 37 years old when I got found AA and uh, I married my wife. I was only about 25 years old. In 1948 I married her. Uh, 26. Yeah, I think I was 27. I was going to be 26 uh, a couple of, about a week and a half because of Thanksgiving we got married in 48. My birthday is December the 5th. Uh, yeah, I, the problem was I didn't realize I was an alcoholic because I was being treated for post-traumatic war syndrome, which I had, but sober I could cope with it. And uh, my whole life changed once I found AA. I got my family back. I was able to send my kids to the best schools. Uh, my daughter has a three-year master's degree. My son is a doctor in Bronx, New York. Uh, I can't complain. Uh, I've had a very good life. I had a wonderful wife. When she died, there was 105 donations and cards in her name. What do you want to know now? Um, well, I can't tell you that. <laughs> I'll keep with you. Um, let's see. What do you remember? Um, what do you re release from the prisoner board camp? No. It was the beginning of September. And we were there for about a week, a week and a half longer week and a half, and then we were flown out. It took them almost two and a half to three days to get the 1185 men out. We went out in B-17s, the planes that flew out of, most of them flew out of Italy. The whole 15th Air Force was there. We had fighter pilots all around there, and, and they'd come and would make sure that the planes weren't being attacked. Uh, I was one of the first ones to come back because I was an injured one. There were about 67 of us that were injured out of the 1185 that came home. And uh, they put me in a uh, stretcher and took me out. Uh, this is the letter I got from last night. This is the letter we got, I got from Major General Twain when I came back to the state, to, to Italy. Wow. Okay. I get a letter from Major General congratulating you. That's a good letter. Uh, you can have that copy. I have a, quite oh, okay. a few of them. Okay, then. That would be great. Uh, just gave me the, interviewed me and did this. Uh, he wrote a book about all these veterans in different wars, from the ones that are you know, dead for years now, Civil War or War of 1812, and then he comes up into World War II and then Korea and Vietnam. Uh, he is in Africa right now. He should be coming back pretty soon. I think he's back. And I enjoy having dinner with him every week and his girlfriend. 
who happens to have an uncle that looks just like me, who I look like him because he's older than me. <laughs> and he comes every week to the to dinner too. It's a group. Uh, when I came back to the States, I had a rough time because I had no place to live. I lived in furnished rooms. Married my wife, I didn't even have that because I lost And uh, I can't complain. Once I sobered up, I had a very good life. Retail of the year in New York State. In 1976, and I did very well. You don't have a house like that over there. Mm -hmm. Now I have trouble. I just cranked a lady told me. I had a feeling that was going to happen, mm -hmm. especially when I got so cold with that. Yeah, definitely. Somebody closed the doors, because otherwise the heat would have come in from the house. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to know? Um, do you, Andre, do you have something? No, I'm, I'm not ready now. No, I'm, I'm, uh, my son will come. He could come at like a... If he says he's going to be there at 11, he'll come at 12 o'clock. <laughs> 12.30. Uh, he lives in Fort Edward. He's a good artist, though. And that's what he should have been, an art teacher, instead of him. He the the story. Are there any questions? Um, when you got back to the States, um, and after the war and everything, and um, after you were sober and everything like that, um, how did you get your, your start in your career? How did I get my start? Anyway? Your, your career, your start. Oh, I started that when I was just a little kid. As a matter of fact, during the Depression years in 1933-34, we had that. My father had a business in our house in Brooklyn. The dining room became the stock room and the basement became the cutting room. And he had the basement fixed up to sell it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I worked uh, there when I was uh, 10 or 11 years old. And uh, once I became 13, which is a, a year in Judaism, that's what you call the Bar Mitzvah. You become like a man. And those days, years ago, they became men, but now you don't. And uh, my father, every summer, would have me travel on the road with him to New England, to New York State. I worked for him for many years, and I worked for other people, too. I even once borrowed money to be a partner with him, but uh, it was a mistake, because he had the wrong attitude toward how to do business right. And I had the right attitude. <laughs> so the money, as a matter of fact, the, I borrowed it from a brother-in-law of mine who had money, and he and I borrowed ten thousand dollars. In those days, that was quite a bit of money. And he said, "Sonny, I'll loan you twenty thousand if you go in business with somebody else." And he was right. And uh, when I first started up my retail business up here. I did it because my wife had tuberculosis and she was away for seven and a half months. And in fact, her mother got sick. I took care of her mother and she couldn't even come in for the funeral when you had tuberculosis. In those days, back in 1964 and 65, it's not like today because the medication is different. I, uh, I came from home. Uh, my father didn't want me to spend the money I did to fix up the store, and I made it one of the nicest looking stores in the whole area. As a matter of fact, that's how I got the store. When I went to the uh, guy who was building the Northway Plaza, he, he asked me, where are my other stores? I said, no, this will be my first store. He said, oh, no, we're not going to start with anybody that's just starting out. Uh, but I didn't quit. And I said, Mr. Castle, I'm going to give you a store that everybody's going to talk about. I have a friend of mine at a store in Buffalo, and he has a designer by the name of Hal Walt that everybody's talking about the store. And he went like that. He opened up his desk drawer and he pulled out my friend's store. It was his cousin that was 
guys have been dis designed for the store. Mm -hmm. You use my cousin Helen Walt, you got a store. Mm -hmm. Well, I became the best store in that mall. Oh. And uh, I've been in three states. I was president of the Menswear Retailers of America and uh, Retailer of the Year in New York State. So I can't complain. I had a very good life. And uh, the most important thing was I was. My wife and I worked together. She was very good at advertising. And uh, she also did some of the bookkeeping. You know, we had uh, an office downtown Glen Falls on Glen Street. And uh, the basement uh, the downstairs, the first floor was the offices, and the second floor was the warehouse where all the stuff came in, and we sent it to all the stores. And we had a very good relationship. I, uh, she was a very wonderful woman. She was three years and ten months older than me. And I immediately became in love with her. And we had a very short uh, uh, until we got married, you know, it was very quick. And uh, I was lucky, I had a wonderful wife. And I've had a good life, even though I died according to this. <laughs> um, you mentioned that um, you worked with your alongside your father during the Depression. Um, what was it like for you to, to grow up during the Depression? It was not easy. And I had a job, my first job I worked when I got out of high school was $10 a week, quarter an hour. And I put in quite a bit of overtime at a quarter an hour. And I remember when they turned it to 40 cents an hour and time and a half for overtime, 60 cents an hour. And I remember coming back in the subways, figuring out how much I made at 60 cents an hour and I couldn't get over it. I worked 19 hours, July the 4th, 1942, when I was working at the Pentagon, building the Pentagon, and double time. I made 57 and a half cents an hour as a laborer, and double time was $1.15 an hour. Wow, I was rich. <laughs> and I took a, I had taken a uh, test to be you needed two years of, uh, oh, is that my son? No. No, that's not it. Both had men look like my son. <laughs> uh, what was I talking about? I was talking about these. Um, you had to have two and a half years of... You had two years of, of, of college. Mm -hmm. or a test. And I took the test and I passed. And oh, about three, four, five months afterwards, you had a, they stopped giving the test and sent the guys to six years, mm -hmm. six months in college. Syracuse had it. There were quite a few colleges that had it. And uh, two of my very close friends, one that took me in who was in brought up in an orphanage, he became a lawyer, and uh, he, prior to that, he didn't have his college, and uh, he uh, had to go to college for six months, and he made it, he became in South Pacific a uh, bombardier navigator, and then I had another friend who was, uh, lost his mother when he was five, father when he was six, and he had, he was the youngest of uh, nine children, and uh, eventually they lost the house, and uh, he was about 15 and a half at the time he had to work. He was a very close friend of mine until he, he passed away a year and a half ago, but I'm still friendly with his daughter, and uh, we had a, he did all right. He became, uh, he did well. 
not right away. He used to hang around butcher shops and fish stores and grocery stores. And he carried the bundles up for the women for three cents, four cents, whatever they give them. Things are very bad then. And that was a very poor neighborhood. So it was even worse there. And uh, I can't complain. I did pretty good. I have no complaints. What else? What did your father do? My father works at Great Meadow um, Correctional Facility um, in Whitehall. So, and um, my mom used to work at the... I, I had, I won't tell you who it was, but I had a young kid who was a friend of my son's who I got into AA and changed his whole life. I saved, I, I helped a lot of people in here. Mm -hmm. It has been a very important thing for me, and it, uh, it works. AA yeah. is in over 150 countries today. And, uh, I'm an active member. Not that I need it anymore, mm -hmm. but there were people there when I needed it to help me. Well, um. your time is up. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> okay. Um, do you remember how you felt when you learned that President Roosevelt had died? Do you remember? Yeah. yeah. I thought very highly of him. And, uh, by the way, nobody's been president as long as he was, if you know this thing. Uh, he had more than in this area, in New York State than in other states. So, and uh, being brought up where I was brought up, I was, uh, I'm a Democrat. I'm an independent, but, uh, but I vote, I still, uh, there are some people I'll vote for up here that uh, I like, because I know personally, and I think they're good. And they run, they run on the uh, Republican Party because that's the way they're going to win. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if you're a Democrat or a Republican, it doesn't really matter. But uh, I, I vote for the person, not the party. And it, it's a little harder on the, the big, you know, the ones in Washington and things like that because you don't know the person as well as you might know. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know people, you know, uh, Sokol is uh, on the board there, and uh, I played poker with him. <laughs> I know him for many years. You know, his brother, you know, his father. Uh, the guy who was, uh, uh, what's his name? I can't think of his name right now. He lived right across the street from me, and he's a nice guy, Taylor. He's involved in politics in this area. So I do, I have voted for Republicans, but I'm basically a Democrat. Uh, in my thoughts, I'm closer to it, because it goes back to the time I was a kid. Mm -hmm. And you can't change that. What else? Um, do you remember, um where you were when you uh, learned that the war had ended? When the war ended? The war ended. I was in a VA hospital, uh, the Army Hospital in Pauling, New York. And they were good there. Originally the uh, place where they, uh, I stayed was where the G officers had their rest homes. It was on a lake, nice property. We had 73 dogs there. Uh, I had a dog too, a dachshund. And uh, I should have realized the name I gave him would have told me that I was an alcoholic. 
because I called him Schnapsy. You know what Schnapsy is? Booze. Mm -hmm. And uh, I couldn't keep him after I left there. But a lot of the guys had post traumatic horse syndrome so badly that they didn't talk to anybody. But once they got a dog, they started to talk and be part of these things. And the 73 dogs were very important. Uh, it helped guys that needed more than just to come back to it. Mm -hmm. It's hard to put into words. Uh, I got out in 1946, March, the end of March, down south, in Tennessee. It was Tennessee. Uh, I lived in French rooms for a while. Yeah, I didn't even have a closet. <laughs> I was in the living room. <laughs> there was no closet there, so they had a rope on the wall. And uh, I, I can't find it as well. When I turned November the 30th, 1947, I was drinking, and I turned the car over five times near Newburgh, New York. And uh, the car landed on my wall leg. Right here. I, have, I have a bad spot down here. Mm -hmm. You can feel it, but it, but it broke it up here. Mm -hmm. and that's how I found Glen Falls. I became a, I was a patient up here for three and a half months, and I found love with that Glen Falls area. But my drinking. It was getting worse and worse and worse. As a matter of fact, the cane I have in my apartment was not the cane I came up, but the had a one of these casts on my that you could walk on. It had a bottom thing in it. And uh, I got drunk one night and I drove my cane against the lamppost by the uh, hotel up to me. Lens Falls, Queensbury. And uh, I look back now and I realize how bad that was. How everything got worse and worse and worse and worse. And my wife did the right thing by separating from me because that made me start to think of why. And then I realized that every time I would get a pass from the VA hospital and get out of the locked ward, I'd get drunk. I wouldn't even remember it. And uh, many times I woke up in hotel rooms in Manhattan because I was in, lived in Brooklyn. And there's uh, mm -hmm. VA hospitals in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and the Bronx. <laughs> I made them all. Kingsbridge. And it was the worst time to have help. You ever hear of prefrontal lobotomy? I lived with them. I had to play baseball with them. Oh my gosh. The wives would come in and scream, what did you do to my husband? That was the worst thing they could have done. I played bridge, and I haven't played bridge since then. My bridge partner, of getting insulin shock treatment. They don't do that anymore. He went into a convulsion and died. Huh? And he told the psychiatrist or psychologist today, oh no, we don't do those things anymore. They were, uh, I got a son that's a doctor and he gets angry at me because I'm sometimes talk about how doctors don't know what the hell they're doing. Especially the ones who are doing psychiatric work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw some terrible things happen. I saw the wives come in with the prefrontal economy. What did you do to my husband? You made a vegetable out of him. One of the Kennedy family was uh, also prefrontal economy. I don't know if you know that. And uh, 
Psychiatry was not a good thing. When I told me my psychiatrist, Dr. Har Mullen, that I found AA and that that's what my problem is, and if I stay sober, I can get comfortable for what did to me. I had a bad time in the war. I lost seven men in my crew. My mother died from the telegram I was listening in action. My father remarried a bitch right away. And uh, as a matter of fact, my mother-in-law, my wife, when I married my wife, went to my sister, she's dead now, and said, Shirley, the room that my daughter had is now empty because she married your brother. You have a right to come and live with me if you want, and she did. And she had a wonderful living there. She got a good job, and she got married there. She married a guy that graduated college at 17. He had a IQ that you couldn't even test. He was one of the smartest men. He was, in the beginning, when he, she married him, he was like a kid. Well, he was young. He was younger than she was, too. But that, that's our family. We all marry young. <laughs> I, I married older, they married younger. <laughs> yeah, both my sisters married guys that were younger than them. And uh, I married a girl who was older than me. Psychiatry is, goes back to like the 14th, 15th century. They, now they only do a little bit of, uh, where they use uh, medication to try and help you, but they, uh, they make a lot of mistakes. And I saw it, and I was there with it. I got a good article there. By the way, this is a picture of me when I was a young guy in the service. You know, I appreciate you doing what you're doing because uh, the next couple of years I won't be around. I'm 88 now and more I live to. Maybe I'll hit 95, maybe I'll only hit 91, you know. Which is okay, I'm happy. I'm happy I got this far. <laughs> and, uh, well, I called my group. There was 1185 that came out of Romania from prison camp. Romania, the Russians came in. And uh, there's less than 200 now. They died. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to realize that you're going to die someday. If you hope you'll be older, if not, uh, you, know, you accept what kind of happens. How old are your parents? Um, my mom is 42 and my father is 43. And they have a good marriage. Good. Mm -hmm. my I'm, I'm going down tonight to, to visit my grandparents, too. Where is it? Uh, Schenectady. Um, they've been married for 46 years. So. I was married 59 years and one day. Married Thanksgiving, 1948. Okay, anything else? Um, I just have one question. We've only got about three minutes left on the tape. Um, so I just have one more question for you. Um, do you find it difficult now um, to to look back on your on your experiences in the war? Not as difficult today as it was years ago. Uh, my mother died in 1944. Well, that's a long time ago. 
She would have been dead anyway, you know. Mm. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So I accepted. Uh, my father, he, he didn't live too long because he had a disease that they were only given the medication, the things that they did to keep the heart going. Uh, for younger guys, and, and uh, he was wrong at a lot of things, but he thought he was right. Mm -hmm. He didn't. He wasn't nasty by being wrong. He didn't do it to be nasty. He just did it because he thought he was doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm sorry to stop you here, but um, our tape is almost out, so. Okay. Um, thank you so much for joining me today.